Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, God demonstrates his own love for us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the love of God. That us rebels here on earth, bent on going away from God, he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. What love the Father has bestowed on us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Not because of your church attendance, not because of your giving record, not because of anything that you have done, but because of his love, his, 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 that's part of his attributes. God is love. You know, he is the purest definition of love. And we rejoice in that love displayed at the cross. Hallelujah. Father God in heaven, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this Sunday morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for what we're fixing to dive into looking at the church of Thyatira. Father, fill our hearts with your love. Fill our hearts with your grace. Fill our hearts with your truth. We pray these things by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit flowing in and through the scriptures, through the word, and through our body. Fill our hearts today. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. And if you agree with that prayer, please say amen. 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 You may have a seat. You may have a seat. Our family, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And we will be studying this morning verses 18 through 29. What we're doing is uh, we're grabbing a church each Sunday and we're, and we're studying these churches and, and diving into the historical setting. What was taking place? What does their name mean? What was the church like? And we're seeing what is being said about this church. Uh, many people look at these seven churches in the book of Revelation as seven different types of churches that exist in the world. And I agree with that. Some people look at these seven churches as, the, as seven dispensations of the church age that the um, church will go through. I agree with that too. I'm cool with that too. But anyway, but this morning we're looking at the church of Thyatira. So let's look at Revelation. I want to read the first three verses and then we'll dive into our study and go all the way to verse 29. So take a look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality, and they eat things sacrificed to idols. Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, bless it to our souls. And Father, as we look at it now, let us get everything we can out of it to grow in our love for you. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my message this morning is the title of the church, the, the tolerant church. That, that was the issue at Thyatira. I want to bring up a map um, each Sunday, we've been going through a church. We started with Ephesus. What was the deal with Ephesus? Ephesus was what? The loveless church. They had left their first love, and Christ corrects them and says, hey, return to your first love. Then we looked at the church of uh, Smyrna. What was the deal with Smyrna? Smyrna was the suffering church. Remember, they had the bishop. The bishop his name was Polycarp. And in 160 AD, he was... Uh, apprehended by the Roman authorities and burned at the stake. They, they, they endured intense persecution. Then you go up the, church, up the coast to Pergamum. Pergamum was the capital of Asia Minor. And Pergamum, the church at Pergamum, they were the church of compromise. Remember, we looked at their city. We looked at all the temples that surrounded them in their city. And they were, they were heavily influenced by the pagan religions around them. And some of the believers there were partaking in Christianity and the paganism, and they were compromising, and Christ corrects them for that. So now we go about 70 miles inland to the church at Thyatira. 
Thyatira was a military outpost city strategically established to protect Asia Minor's capital of Pergamum from Eastern invasion. The name Thyatira means sweet savor of labor. Life in Thyatira centered around what we call trade guilds. That would be what we call today unions. Uh, there were potters, coppersmith, and tanners. It was the center of the fabric and dye industry. Does that jostle anybody's memory back to the book of Acts? That Thyatira was the center of the fabric and dye industry. In Acts chapter 16, verse 14, the apostle has this really cool encounter. It says, a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabric, a worshiper of God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Can I say that this morning, that that's my prayer for us this morning, is that the same thing happens to us that, that happened to Lydia that the Lord opens our hearts as we study the word. As you study the word of God and the Holy Spirit works on your heart, he opens your heart and you see the Lord in a new and fresh way to where you just love him and you want to obey him. So Lord, open our hearts this morning. Spirit of the living God, do your work like only you can do. Like you did in Lydia's heart, do it in our heart. The church at Thyatira was doing some great things. But like other churches, Christ had some serious issues with them. One of the things I'm thankful for as we study these seven churches is there was really no perfect church. Well, guess what? There's still no perfect church today. But God, by his grace, by the Holy Spirit, by the word of God, he's molding us and making us. And when a church gets off the path, Christ comes in and brings us back. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for grace. So let's look at verse 18. Verse 18 is Jesus is talking to the church at Thyatira. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. So what do we have here in the opening verse? We have the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory. Okay, this is the glorified Christ. And what does it say? It says his eyes are like a flame of fire. Okay, Hebrews chapter four, verse 13 says, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He sees, family, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Jesus of the Bible, the creator of the, the sovereign Lord of the universe, he sees to the very core of our being, okay? I can't see your thoughts. You can't see my thoughts, but the Lord Jesus Christ can. The Lord Jesus Christ, that can be encouraging and that can be scary, depending on what's on your mind. Because there's some of the things in my mind some days I don't want people to see. And I have to confess them as sin and repent. But then there's sometimes there's things on my mind that hurt my heart, that weigh heavy. And I'm very thankful that the Lord Jesus Christ sees what's on my mind and what's on my heart. He sees the very intent of our heart. I can fool you, you can fool me, but we can't fool the Lord Jesus. And it says his feet are like burnished bronze. This burnished bronze, this, this, this speaks of, of the Lord Jesus Christ in his purity, in his holiness. Jesus is sinless. He is perfect. He never sinned. He was deity. He was God. He was, the, as, as, as John the Baptist says, he was the perfect lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know, we talk about God being holy. God the Father is holy, but so is the Lord Jesus Christ. So is the Holy Spirit. God is holy. He's separate from sin. He, 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 he hates sin. He hates sin so much that he punished his son at the cross by, by, by Jesus becoming our propitiation for, for our, the sacrifice of our sins so, so that we could be forgiven. So his flame, he's like a flame of fire. His feet are like burnished bronze. He's not meek and mild. He's the sovereign Lord. 
saying this is how things are going to be done. Verse 19, he says, I know your deeds, your love and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds are, are deeds of late are greater than first. What does this say about the Lord Jesus Christ? What is verse 19 when you read it? What does it tell you? What, what piece of information does it give you about Christ? It tells you about Jesus' omniscience. His omniscience. He knows all things. Look at that first, that first two words in verse 19. He says, I know. That's a verb in the completed tense of the vocabulary. In other words, it's complete. Jesus Christ knows everything. He knows what you had for breakfast this morning. He knows the first thoughts on your brain this morning. He knows every single detail of your life. Okay? That's why we can say that Jesus is mighty to save. Because he knows. He knows you, family. And there may be some people here this morning, you know, things have gone south. Things aren't going the way you wanted them to in life. And maybe you've, you've blown it. And you, you know you're not where you're supposed to be. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning, Jesus knows exactly where you're at. He knows exactly where you're at. And if you will humble yourself and submit yourself to him, he will help you. He will come alongside you and he will show you grace as you humble yourself under his mighty hand. The things he says to the church at Thyatira is interesting. He says, I know your deeds. In other words, the, the church at Thyatira, they're hard workers. They're known for their actions. He says, I know your love. This fellowship is deep and rich and, and agape and, and philo love. He says, I know your faith. They believe the scriptures. They believe the Bible. He says, I know your faith. They believe the scriptures that they had in their possession. They believed the word of God. He says, I know your service. Evidently, they were involved in ministry and they were serving others. He says also there in verse 19, um, I know your perseverance. They patiently endured with all steadfastness. And look at the very end of it, at the very end of the verse. It says, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. You know what that tells me? They were growing. They were growing. Can we just close our Bibles and go home now? Praise the Lord, hallelujah. What an awesome message. So encouraging. They have it together. They're serving the Lord. They're doing the right thing in God's eyes. If we could just stop right there, that would be awesome. But unfortunately, as with all the churches, there were some issues at the church. And because Christ is omniscient, and he sees all things and he knows all things, he's like, I got to address some issues. Again, Christ sees what man can't see. He knows who is real and who is not. I want to encourage you this morning to make an appeal to the Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of, on behalf of his omniscience. Lord, please show me where my heart truly is. Okay? That needs to be a heart cry for every, every one of you guys. That's my heart cry, is Lord, show me. Show me exactly where I am at. Because that's the most important thing. You know, you see me on the outside, I see you on the outside. But let's get real. And let's look at what's on the inside. And let's pray and ask God to show us, Lord. You know, this ain't about judgment or condemnation. This is about growing and sanctification and serving the Lord and becoming more available to him in service. That's what it's all about. So let's look at the issue. Let's look at the issue. Look at verse 20. He says, but I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. The church at Thyatira, their issue was they were tolerating Jezebel. Uh, now, this could be an actual woman there at the church, or it could be false teachers. False teachers teaching what Jezebel taught in the Old Testament. Think about this for a minute. Who's going to name their daughter Jezebel? <laughs> I mean, really? 
that's just the name we don't name. That's just the name we don't use. But, but based on some of the language in the verses, many scholars believe that it wasn't a woman per se, but it was some false teachers within the church who were bringing in the doctrines of Baal and the doctrines of, uh, of Jezebel from the Old Testament. Jezebel was the wife of Ahab in uh, 1 Kings. She led her husband in Israel into idolatry, Baal worship, and sexual immorality. She was ruthless. She was evil, and she was void of God in her life. So either there is a woman in this church or there are false teachers telling the Christians at Thyatira that you can serve Christ and live in immorality and partake of pagan religions. And family, that is false teaching. That is false teaching. God calls us to be holy. God calls us to be set apart. Now, when we come to Christ, we need to be discipled. We need to grow. We need to grow in grace. We need to grow in our relationship with Christ. And there's some areas in our life in these areas that aren't where they should be. But as you grow as a Christian, you should grow out of immorality. You should grow out of paganism. And uh, Jesus died on the cross to forgive us and set us free from the bondage of immorality. But here's the punchline. You ready for this? Jesus is not even talking to Jezebel in this passage. Take another look at it. Look at the opening of verse 20. He says, but I have this against you. He's talking about the church that you tolerate. The greatest threat in the church at Thyatira was not from the outside the church. Their greatest threat was from inside the church. They were tolerating a false teacher, just letting it continue, turning a blind eye. And they would not address it. To tolerate A a tolerating church that allows, permits, or condones something scripture forbids is wrong. Many times it'll fly under the guise of love and not wanting to offend. And that cannot be the case. We are called to, in a spirit of grace, in a spirit of love, in a spirit of truth, confront the error, confront the sin. We do it in grace, we do it in love, but we have to deal with it. We have to deal with it. We are, we are called and we are commanded to deal with it. I want to give you five characteristics of, 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 a toler, of a tolerant church. Five characteristics of a church like Thyatira today. Number one, number one, the first characteristic of a tolerant church is this. They conform to the world around them. That's the first sign of a church that tolerates false teachers is they conform to the world around them. They do whatever it takes to be like the world. They dumb down the message, they get away from the Bible, and Sunday morning becomes nothing more than a TED Talk. It's like going and watching Oprah. And in this church, we got to be in the Word. We got to be in the Word. The Word guides us. The Word leads us. The Word directs us. Number two, the second characteristic of a tolerant church is they no longer call sin what it is. Okay? If the word of the Lord is spoken and said what sin is, then that's what sin is. Sin is lawlessness, rebellion, treason, is spiritual adultery, it's breaking God's commands. They remove these offensive phrases and replace them with phrases like, well, we all make mistakes. And what this does is this causes people to label their sin as their struggle, and they think this gives them permission to stay in a place of continual sin throughout their life. That is the sign of a tolerant church. Number three, they forsake absolute truth for relativism. Relativism teaches that there is no absolute truth, that everybody in the world can have their own truth and nobody's wrong. We're all just singing kumbaya. That goes against what the Bible teaches, okay? Because Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, for nothing can be done against the truth, but only for the truth. The biblical worldview is there's one truth, and that's God's truth. And that is the only truth. Now, there's, there's lots of other things in the world that are true, but they align with that truth, Okay? There's not many ways to God. There's only one way to God, and that's through the cross, through the Lord Jesus Christ. But 
but the, but the tolerant church. You could also, some, some scholars, some teachers will, will title this message the liberal church. Tolerant church, liberal church, they kind of go hand in hand. But they forsake absolute truth for relativism. The next one, this is one we, we see creeping into our world today. They move close-handed issues into open hands. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Moving close-handed issues into open hands. Close-handed issues are principles of morality and truth that are founded on Scripture. They are foundational. Examples would be God's moral law, right and wrong, and biblical truth. The hand is closed because the Scripture is clear on the subject. And we hold to that truth. Now, if the Scripture does not address a specific subject, i.e. age of the earth, eschatology, or government issues, then the hand is open and we can debate it. But if the scripture makes it clear, the Christian hand is closed and we hold these truths to be evident, to be truth, and, and we don't budge because the scripture is very clear on them. If the scripture says that adultery, lying, and stealing is a sin, your opinion doesn't matter. My opinion doesn't matter. It is settled and the hand is closed. Listen to C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said, an open mind in questions that are not ultimate is useful. But an open mind about ultimate foundations is either theoretical or practical reason is idiocy. If a man's mind is open on these things, let his mouth be shut. That was C.S. Lewis. You can't move foundational truth. You, you, you get into a very dangerous place. And Paul told Timothy, he said, the church is to be the what? The pillar of truth. The pillar of truth. We, we don't create truth. We don't invent truth. We just follow the truth. And we hold to that truth. Number five, the fifth thing that, uh, a tolerant church does, is they fail to take a stand for truth. The church sees error, they see sin, and they choose to stay silent. Family of God, Christians everywhere that are watching online, this is a path that we cannot go down. This is a path we cannot go down. The church, the body of Christ, the spiritual body of Christ in the earth, uh, our Baptist brothers, our Pentecostal brothers, our Calvary Chapel, our Methodists, and all the other bodies, everyone, all believers, all, all believers, we believe the truth, we love the truth, we defend the truth, and we stand for the truth. We are the voice that God speaks through in the world. That's why as Christians, we have to take a stand when we see error. We have to take a stand, and we can't be tolerant. Again, that doesn't mean we're a jerk. That doesn't mean that we're mean. That doesn't mean that, we, that we're rude and arrogant. No, we're none of that. We are loving, graceful, kind, generous. We show every ounce of sympathy and remorse and love as we stand for the truth. We're not in the business of offending people unless the truth offends them. If the truth offends them, that's between them and the Lord. But we have to stand, and we can't be a tolerant church. This church, man, they had it going on. And maybe they were just thinking, hey, we just want to show love. We just want to show love. We want to show compassion. And, be, and, and their, their, love, their love meter was so high that they were willing to tolerate Jezebel. And Christ says, that can't happen. Let's continue, verse 21. He says, I, look at this. This is beautiful, okay? Look at verse 21. You could just circle verse 21 and right above it, right out to the side, grace. Look at verse 21. He says, I gave her time to repent. And she does not want to repent of her immorality. Even to the false teacher. Even to Jezebel or these people that were espousing the doctrines of Jezebel. He's like, I gave you time to repent. You know, God is not this mean God ready to just stomp people out. By his grace and by his spirit, he woos people to repent. 
to come back to him. And, and, and he shows, he, he's, he's saying, I gave her time to repent. I gave her time to repent. In other words, I, I held back my judgment because I wanted, Jesus even loves the false teachers, but they got to repent. They got to repent and they got to turn wholeheartedly to him. Second Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promises, some count slowness, but patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And then the second half of verse 21, it says, She does not want to repent of her immorality. That's the number one reason people uh, refuse to come to Christ, by the way. That's the number one reason why people refuse to completely surrender their life to Christ, it's because they don't want to give up their sin. That was the case for Pastor David. In 1991, 1990, 1991, I didn't want to give up my sin. People were witnessing to me and sharing the gospel. And I was like, okay, okay, follow Jesus, okay, repent, believe in him, live for him, be a Christian. But then I, I got to quit, stop doing that. Oh, no, 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 I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready for that. I, 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 honest Abe, that was my heart. It, that was my heart. I was like, no, 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 I'm not giving up my sin, man. I love my sin. But I didn't want to give it up. It wasn't until the, the Holy Spirit opened my eyes and showed me the darkness of the sin and, and showed me how it separated me from the Lord that I finally came to a point. I was like, Ugh, get out of here, sin. I'm pursuing Christ with all my heart. Verse 22, he says, this gets deep, family. Check it out. Look in your Bible. Verse 22, behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. This is very, very severe consequences for this false teacher or this Jezebel in the church. The very instrument and place of her immorality, the bedroom, will be the place of her suffering. That is that is tough, and it gets even deeper. Look at verse 23. And I will kill her children with pestilence. Now, this is not talking about her physical children, okay? This is not talking about her physical children. This, I believe, is talking about her spiritual children. The, the, the children that are born spiritually from the offspring of this false teaching that you can trust in Christ and live in immorality. Those who continue in this false teaching is who he's talking about in verse 23. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the mind and hearts. I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Here again, the, the text brings us back to the omniscience of the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows our minds, he knows our hearts, and he knows our works. Personally, in my Christian walk, I'm not worried about what you think. I'm not worried about the, what the world thinks. All I care about is what Christ thinks. All I care about is what Christ thinks. Because one day I'm going to leave this world and I'm going to stand before him in all his glory. My wife's not going to be there. My children's not going to be there. My pastor's not going to be there. It's just going to be me and the Lord Jesus Christ in all his beautiful glory. And that's, that's the one I got to please. That's the one that we aim to please. It's because he is the one who sees it all. Verse 24, but I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Verse 24 is very encouraging to me because what it tells me about the church at Thyatira is not everyone was involved in the false teaching. Okay? Praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for that. You know, not just because there's some bad things taking place in a church doesn't mean the whole church is bad. It, the, let, the, let the truth be told that we all have areas where we need to improve on. But it's, it's the responsibility, though, of the church leadership to lovingly, gracefully address the issues within the local church so that we're solid and so that we're, we're doctrinally sound and so that our life is founded on the truth of Scripture and the truth of God's Word. You know, we're not here trying to nitpick people or pick people apart, but, 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 but our, it is our job, though, to be faithful to the text and to be faithful to the Scripture. And he, and he says here in verse 24, um, those who have not known the deep things of Satan, what are the deep things of Satan? The deep things of Satan would be the teaching of Jezebel. And the teaching of Jezebel was, yeah, you can serve Yahweh, you can serve God. 
but you can also live in rebellion. You can also participate in pagan religions. You can also participate in the pagan immorality and the prostitution that took place in those ancient temples there in Asia Minor. And Christ says you can't do that. You know, and he says to those who are faithful in Christ, verse 24, you keep pushing forward. You keep doing what's right. What is, what is, what is doing right today? Doing right today is, is walking in the spirit, walking in truth, is uh, walking in love, is studying the word, is fellowshipping with believers. It's getting real. It's getting real, family. And, and washing ourselves with the word of God. People say at Calvary Chapel, man, you, you people, y'all just brainwash people with the word of God. And to that I say, Amen. We wash our brains and we wash our hearts with the word of God. And that's what some of those at Thyatira were doing. But some of them weren't. And hopefully, church history tells us that this church only lasted a couple hundred years. That that they they went away in in the um, second century. We're not exactly sure. We don't know what happened. But maybe it was because of what was going on there. Hopefully not. Hopefully, you know, they convince the people to repent and turn to Christ. But they only lasted a couple hundred years. This city is still there today. Um, Verse 25, he says, Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. Hold fast to what? Go back to verse... Go back to verse 19. Hold fast to your deeds. Hold fast to your love. Hold fast to faith. Hold fast to service. Hold fast to uh, perseverance. Man, hold fast, man. You're in this thing. Man, I, I, you, you're, 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 you're growing your roots deep in the scriptures. You're walking in the spirit. Continue to do those things that please the Lord, okay? He's made a way for you to, to live out this Christian life. You can't do it on your own. You can't do it in your own flesh. But you have to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, and by the way, on Wednesday nights, I said eight-week study on the Holy Spirit. It's probably going to be closer to 10 to 12 weeks because we are just taking our time on Wednesday nights studying the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We're looking at everything the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. And this coming up Wednesday, man, I'm already getting ready for Wednesday, we, we may spend most of the night on healing, on healing from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where he talks about the gifts of healing. We are going to leave here Wednesday night and we're going to know, I, I want to go through everything the Bible talks about healing. And then after we talk about healing, because healing is in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, then we're going to talk about miracles. Then we're going to talk about prophecy. We're going to talk about tongues. We're going to talk about all the gifts of the Spirit. God has given gifts to the body of Christ so that they can be ministered to, so that we, we could build each other up. So if you want to know what it's like to walk in the Spirit or, well, David, Pastor David, what does the Bible say about miracles? Do miracles still happen? What about healing? Does healing still happen? What about tongues? What about interpretation? Uh, number three is we may get to prophecy this Wednesday, but it might be the next. But what does the Bible say about prophecy? We're going to be studying all those things. You know, Calvary Chapel is a watering hole, man. We're just going to get into the Word. We're going to study it. And I want to help you guys grow in your love, in your walk, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can be like verse 25. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. Hold fast to those truths of the Christian faith. Let's wrap it up. Verse 26. He who overcomes, he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. As I also have received authority from my Father, I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Family, there is reward in serving Christ. There is eternal reward in serving Christ. You're, now, there's nothing you can do to be saved, okay? Salvation is a free gift. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But to the, how much you give your life in service to Christ, how much you live for him, how much you make yourself available to him, there will be a reward in the kingdom. At Calvary Chapel, we believe the next prophetic event is the rapture of the church. After the rapture of the church, there will be a tribulation period. After the tribulation period, there's going to be a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ. 
Okay? There's going to be this literal 1,000 year reign of Christ. And each one of you in here, if you're in Christ, you get to be a part of that kingdom. But there's going to be rewards. It's not, and by the way, it's, it's not going to be a democracy. The government as we know it today will no longer be. It will not be a democracy. It will be a theocracy where Jesus Christ rules and reigns. And he is going to give you assignments in the kingdom. He's going to give you assignments in the kingdom. To, to, he says in verse, look at the second half of verse 26 is where I got this from. To him I will give authority over the nations. Who is he going to give authority over the nations? To him who overcomes. Man, put on your boxing gloves. Put up a good fight. Fight the good fight. Man, let the devil have it. You know, when the devil comes against you and comes against your family and temptation and all that's taking place, that spiritual warfare, man, fight like nobody's business. How do I fight, Pastor David? Get into the word. Get on your knees. Pray. Intercede. Call out to God. Uh, clean house. Do those things you need to do to, to, to clear out the garbage and, and the trash in our house. But we got to fight. Why? Because look at the verse. So that you can overcome. To, to the, the, the word overcome, think about the, the, the definition of the word. It implies that there is a battle. Okay? Okay? There is a battle to Christianity. There is a battle to serving Christ. Are you up for the battle or are you going to wimp out? Fight the good fight. Put on the full armor of God. Serve Christ. There, 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 is, a, there is a finish line, okay? You won't run this race forever. You won't fight this fight forever. There is a finish line when you run into the arms <laughs> of the Lord Jesus Christ and the battle will be over when you see him face to face. Verse 28 says, um, I will give him the morning star. Ooh, what is that? What is the morning star? If you turn over to Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, it'll tell you what the morning star is. Jesus is the morning star. Jesus will be your reward. Okay? Jesus will be your reward. Eternal life. The old life, the struggle with sin, struggle with temptation, the bad things of life that happen, death, suffering, difficult times, sicknesses, all that stuff, it'll all be gone because you will, have, you will partake of the morning star the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. The Scripture says that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It's the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Remember we talked about um, Lydia in the very beginning, Acts chapter 16? It says the, um, the Lord opened her heart. It's the Holy Spirit that opens our heart. Are you hungry? Have I watered your taste buds? I hope so. And my hope and my prayer is that you go home and like nobody's business, man, you read your Bible, you spend time in prayer, and you get ready for the return of Christ. You get ready for him to revive your soul. You get, you get on fire for God. I think it was John Wesley or Charles Spurgeon. I'm not sure which one of them said it. One of them says, get on fire for God, and the world will come to watch you burn. Family, let's get on fire for the Lord. Let's serve him. And, and I, know, I know we're a small church. I know most of you guys. And you guys are doing an amazing job serving the Lord, ministering to the family of God. And this is an amazing time to be alive. Let's continue. Let's continue to serve Christ. Knowing as we're studying the book of Revelation, he will come again. Let's live with an eternal perspective. You know, in life, I, I plan my life as though I'm going to live to 100 so I'm halfway there. <laughs> That's my plan. That I, I, plan, I plan out that I'm going to live a long life. But in my daily living, I, my heart's desire is to live as though he's coming tomorrow. No man knows the day. No man knows the hour. We don't, we don't get into predictions. 
because Jesus said not to. But let's keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. Father, thank you for the church at Thyatira. Lord, uh, help us to be like them in the area of good works, good deeds, and, and, and serving. Father God, their faith, their service, their perseverance, their deeds. And as verse 19 said, they're, they're greater than the first. We're growing. But Lord God, help us, Lord, not to be a tolerant church. But help us to speak the truth in love. Help us to walk in love. And help us to hold and maintain the standard of your word in all matters of Christianity and in our church life. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.